Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Cecilia Munoz. I'm a senior advisor at New America, and it is my job to welcome you all to this conversation about system error, where big tech went wrong, and how we can reboot. We are very excited about having this conversation today. We have all three authors with us. I'm going to introduce them very briefly and introduce my co-moderators, and then we're going to get this conversation started. So let me start with Rob Reich, who is director of Stanford University Center for Ethics and Society, co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, and associate director of its Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, a busy guy. Mehran Sahamni, an early Google employee who helped invent email spam filtering technology. Thank you so much, Mehran. <laughs> He is currently the Associate Chair for Education in the Stanford University Computer Science Department. And Jeremy Weinstein, my friend and former colleague, who launched the Obama Administration's Open Government Partnership and currently is both a professor of political science at Stanford and leads Stanford Impact Labs, which partners research teams with leaders in the public, private, and social sectors to try to solve public problems. Um, welcome to the three of you and thank you for writing this wonderful book. Um, we, I also have a couple of amazing uh, co-moderators for this session. There were so many of us who were excited about this book that we are just all in on the conversation, um, starting with Anne-Marie Slaughter, who's the CEO at New America, and Tara McGinnis, who leads New America's New Practice Lab, which is sort of putting public interest technology into practice in the service of family economic security. So as we start the conversation, Anne-Marie, I'm going to turn to you first to ask the first question. I'll just let everybody know that we're using something called Slido to submit questions. So if you have questions, Slido is the box located to the right of the video. And if you have any issues using it, you can contact events at newamerica.org if you have any questions. But please look for the, the Slido box next to the video to start asking your questions. And with that, let's get this conversation started. Anne-Marie, over to you. Terrific. So I have to also start by just saying this is a terrific book and it's a tested book because I happen to know that the three of you taught a course uh, in this general area for quite a number of years. And I, I have a very good friend and colleague who sat in who said she just found it revelatory. Uh, and I, wa I wanna start by saying how terrific it is that we have you know, computer scientists and ethicist and, and ethical philosopher uh, and a political scientist who, are, who collaborated on such a complex subject. I, mean, we, I really do think we need more of this, particularly when we're talking tech, uh, because you know, we're not gonna suddenly understand the computer science, nor the political science, nor the ethical considerations. So just my plug uh, for the book. And Jeremy, I'm going to, I mean, I'm a policy person, you're a policy person. I'm going to start with a more policy question uh, because, you know, given that the title is, you know, where big tech went wrong and how to fix it, in Washington, that conversation often defaults to break it up, right? That, that it's an antitrust issue. That's the problem. They're too big. They're monopolies. We should break them up. Uh, and so I want to start by saying, what's your all's view on that question, or how would you frame that question and answer it? So thanks so much, Anne-Marie, Cecilia, and Tara for having us today. It's such a great pleasure to be with this group. And in many ways, the three of us have been a part of a burgeoning movement around public interest technology that New America, with Ford and others, has really helped to create. We see that as just an extraordinarily valuable community to be a part of as we're having these really hard conversations. And so thank you for your leadership uh, on that effort. Um, Anne-Marie, I wouldn't let the issue be framed as antitrust uh, on its own. And in fact, one of the central arguments of the book is that as we confront a set of successive issues where new technologies have not only extraordinary benefits, but also evident societal harms, we do ourselves a disservice if we don't try and understand the roots of those problems. What are the systemic features uh, of, the, of the repeated cycle that we see of new technologies having societal effects? And for us, it's not only about policy or the failure of policy. It's really three ingredients. Number one, an approach in engineering that we call the optimization mindset that really is at the core of why when new technologies are developed, we can't think of them as value neutral. They basically surface and prioritize the achievement of some ends 
at the expense of other ends. And ultimately right now those decisions are being made inside companies. The second element is a structure of the venture capital industry that basically scales new technologies before we understand their potential harms. And so the focus on, on unicorns and the desire to dominate markets quickly uh, has these kinds of social effects at a very large scale. And then of course, the third piece is the role of our politics. And the role of our politics isn't just the present day question that we face about antitrust, but in fact, uh, a successive cycle of of, of a race between democracy and disruption that unfolds with every new technology. And what we have in this context is, 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 an, is a sort of a vowed commitment to creating a regulatory oasis around big tech from the 1990s into the present. And so what bring, where that brings me is just to say that our answer is, is not that we're gonna solve this through one regulatory silver bullet, whether it's antitrust or data privacy law, uh, or audits of algorithmic decision-making, but that we're actually gonna have to tackle these issues by looking at the, the ethic of responsibility in technology companies, mm -hmm. thinking about the corporate power that has been concentrated uh, in a small number of firms, but also how we set in place a set of democratic institutions that are capable of governing tech. And in the book, we look at all three of those arenas as places for action. Um, and the good news is that we're starting to see a conversation in Washington where people are waking up to the problems of the present. People are waking up to the set of regulatory issues that are on the table, antitrust among them. But we also need to keep our eye on the problems that we can't yet see and recognize that if we, if we don't address these underlying drivers of the problem, it's just gonna be the next technology that generates harmful social effects and a data privacy law won't have solved that nor will the breakup of a couple large companies, that won't have solved that problem either. Great. Shara, why don't you take the next question? Sure. Um, I was really struck reading the book that uh, it occupies a different space from other pieces. And part of that I do wonder is whether it comes from your diversity of backgrounds. Um, three Stanford professors, but with really different roots in political science and computer science. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of coming together and how that impacted breaking out of having an exclusively technical book or an exclusively you know, a political ethical book. May Ron, can we start with you? Sure. Well, part of the, the impetus for the book was seeing that on campus there had really been a shift toward engineering and computer science over the last 10 years. Um, and this is not true just at Stanford, but it's a national phenomenon. Um, at Stanford, specifically enrollments in computer science have grown by about 350% in the last 10 years. So it's the largest major by far on campus, about one out of five undergrads majors in computer science. And this shift had really you know, taken a lot of students away from other disciplines. And so one of the impetuses was to think about how do we have a larger conversation where we get the computer scientists to think about issues from other parts of campus, to think about the social science that might be involved in evaluating technologies, to think about the philosophical background and value trade-offs that are involved in building those technologies. So we came together and for a year, we spent just talking and discussing and putting the class together before we even offered the first iteration of it. We have to find a common language to talk as to, you know, what are the different aspects of the different fields we come from? How do they fit together? How do the ideas kind of as puzzle pieces begin to form into a larger picture? And that's what we wanted students to take away. And from doing that class, as we were going through it and building out materials and having conversations with students and speakers who would come in, it became clear that we wanted to try to reach a larger audience. And that became the seed for the book itself is how do we take some of these ideas form them together in something that's cohesive and comprehensive that we can provide to, to a broader public. And part of the reason for doing that is we really need public engagement, as Jeremy talked about, to, to deal with these issues in a systematic way. It's not just about having technologists try to affect something inside a company. It's not just about having venture capitalists or executives make different decisions. It's about getting everyone involved to understand the role they play in the larger policy issues in our democracy to achieve better societal outcomes. Rob or Jeremy, anything you would want to add? 
I'll just add an anecdote that sort of crystallizes for me both, you know, why the course seems important. And, and you know, we used the language when we were developing the course is that it wasn't just we thought it would be intellectually interesting to have a, a philosopher, um, a, a, a public a public policy expert or a social scientist like Jeremy is, and then a technical person like Maron to come together. It was aimed as a cultural intervention on campus. And why did we want a cultural intervention? So here's just an anecdote to crystallize it. I was teaching five years ago an introductory course in the fall semester for the first year students. And, and I had in my class, that was a philosophy class, um, you know, a hundred or so students that came to my office hours, a bunch of them a couple of weeks later. So these are students that only been on campus for four or five weeks. One student came and I, making small talk said, you know, well, what are you thinking of majoring in? What do you want to do when you're at Stanford? And he said, I'm going to be a computer science major. Absolutely for sure. And like I had startup ideas already when I was in high school and I just can't wait until the next semester when I can take the venture capital class and meet the people who are going to fund my next startup idea. So I continued on and said, oh, well, so what's your big startup idea? And the 18 year old, you know, totally sincerely and earnestly looked in my eyes and said, well, professor, to tell you my startup idea, I'd have to ask you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I was sort of taken aback at how, how the socialization of the whole Valley's ethos um, had already sunk into the, to the first year students on campus. Now there's nothing wrong, of course, with having a startup idea, but that sort of symbolizes for me the, the conveyor belt that Stanford has created where you hop on the computer science major early, you do really hard work, it's not an easy major, and then the world comes knocking on your doorstep to induct you into a startup company or a big tech company. And you don't really get much training necessarily in thinking about the social science or ethical considerations that go into the power of big tech. And that was the you know, important aspect of the course. And then what we hope to do in the book as well. So I'd and love to, to follow up on that, if I may, and, and put, with a question to you, Rob, in particular. One of the points that you all make in the book is that technologies are encoding values and I'd love for you to explain a little bit what you mean and give to maybe give us some examples. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a, a, an old thought that, you know, what technologists do is somehow more objective or at least value neutral compared to human decision making, which of course we know is biased and flawed and irrational in so many different ways. And what a algorithmic model or a deep learning machine learning approach to a problem can do is provide some sort of scientific or technical objectivity. But what really happens is that um, these models encode within them a set of choices about values. And at the moment, the only people who get to have a say in how those values are decided or traded off are the technologists themselves. So let me give you a couple of examples. Think about the messaging, text messaging service that you use, whether it's Apple's iMessage or WhatsApp or Signal, if you're really concerned about your privacy. So there's a technical system, um, an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platform that attempts to prioritize individual privacy. Neither the government nor even the company can inspect the content of your message if you're using an end-to-end -end encrypted platform. But of course, as we all know, there are other considerations at play when we think about what goes on in text messaging. Um, Apple just announced recently that it was going to try to inspect the photos um, that are uploaded to iCloud in order to try to prevent um, child pornography and various forms of sex trafficking. So text messaging can also be an arena for terrorist coordination. So there are values of national security as, long as, as well as personal safety. And when technologists decide, well, it's just really cool to optimize for privacy, that is, is a good thing, but it's not the only good thing. And you can keep going. You know, We all know on the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever these are, um, well, there's a commitment in certain respects to freedom of expression, and that's a good thing. And yet these platforms are a forum for the proliferation or amplification of hate speech and the insult of individual dignity that happens on a routine basis in the platforms, as well as, of course, the pollution of an information ecosystem with misinformation and disinformation. So at the moment, the only people are in particular, like Mark Zuckerberg is the governor of the speech environment of 4 billion people, choosing uh, literally on his own or his own authority alone, um, how it is to balance 
freedom of expression versus dignity versus the informational health of a democracy. That's way too much power for one person to have. And the value trade-offs I'm just identifying are the beginnings of how any technology encodes within it a set of important choices that we all ought to have a say in refereeing. I've got, I got I've got many, many questions uh, that just jumping from that, but I, I, I guess I'll start uh, with Mehran, particularly on this optimization question, right? I mean, the, and you know, we've written papers on it's the business model, right? It's really this this idea of, as you say, efficiency above all, personalization, right? To the point that. Yes, uh, you know, a Facebook user can can see things on their feed that will help them, but so too can an advertiser target ethnic hatreds, right? <laughs> In a way of uh, so so Mehran, maybe you could talk to us as a computer scientist about how how do you regulate these algorithms? I mean, how how can you do you create other companies that have better algorithms and hope that there is then competition, but then you know, Facebook's got 4 billion users. How are you going to compete about that? Is it is it interoperability? I'd love to hear from you a more technical explanation uh, in layman's language. That's a great question. And in part of the issue is that uh, there are technologies that we can use in some sense to monitor our other technologies. Huh. So one thing, for example, with content moderation is automated algorithms. And Facebook does this. Some of the other platforms do, do this to varying degrees of success in different areas uh, to build algorithms to do that content moderation, to identify things that might be hate speech or might be bullying or whatever the case may be, and then either filter it from the system or flag it from the system. But there's a lot of knobs in there to think about how strictly you want to do that content moderation and also how much virality you want to give to a piece of information. So, you know, as the old saying goes, you know, lies spread halfway around the world before truth gets its pants on. It doesn't have to be that way. We can actually use the algorithms to slow down the lies that spread around the world by allowing for the amount of replication of a piece of information to be limited until that information, for example, can be verified. We can do those kinds of things algorithmically. And at that point, it becomes a question of the policies of the companies, what they actually wanna do. You brought up the antitrust question before, and that's an interesting one, right? Sometimes, some, sometimes people wonder, if I took Facebook and broke it up into 10 little Facebooks, would that solve the problem? And by itself, it probably wouldn't unless we got some really strong, as you mentioned, interoperability guarantees that allowed for information to migrate between different platforms. Because one of the biggest powers that these platforms has is precisely the network effect, right? You want to be on a platform where all your friends are there, and that creates a monopolistic effect where everyone gravitates toward the same platform. So even if we broke them up, we'd probably actually just see a reconsolidation unless there was really a way to share data between them. And there have been proposals to do that. It's just not in the interest of the companies to adopt them, which is why regulation becomes necessary. It's like making your cell phone number portable, right? Because none of us would ever get a new cell phone if you had to give up your number every time. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Uh, how about you? I'm happy to jump in and maybe, uh, uh, sorry, so Jeep, were you, um, the, there's a chapter um, in your book called uh, <laughs> Can Democracies Rise to the Challenge? And I would really love to hear, you know, maybe starting with Jeremy, you, your respective answers to this question, both about democracies writ large and really how about ours? Thanks, Taro. I mean, you know, this is a moment where, and, and, you know, many of us have shared this experience of having had the opportunity to serve the public interest uh, in the federal government or state and local governments where the polarization that we see in the country and the paralysis that we see in Washington is, is deeply dispiriting. Um, you know, a central argument of the book is that there is no way out of the toxic mess that we think we're in within big tech um, without energizing our democracy around this challenge. We basically see the regulation of big tech, um, you know, but regulation can be a loaded word. So what we really mean by regulation is using our political institutions to help us navigate these difficult values trade-offs so that these value trade-offs aren't simply made by technologists and the companies where technologists work. We see that as basically one of the central and existential challenges for democracy 
in the next set of decades. And people have remarked upon, I think to us, the surprising optimism that they read in our book about the potential for democracy to rise to the challenge. And so I wanna say a bit about why I do have a sense of optimism and, and hopefully Rob and, and Maron will add as well. The first is that as three faculty at an institution that is one of the major sort of trainers of the next generation of technologists in Silicon Valley, I see an attention to these concerns that we're teaching about and talking about in the book that wasn't there five years ago. There is a changing dynamic among young technologists, which is no longer a, a sort of rose colored glasses about the ambitious and world changing mission statements of big tech companies, but in fact, a recognition that technology has benefits and also harms and a desire as they think about the use of their own labor to be associated with companies that are making choices that they can live with. That's really powerful to see. And of course, these companies are in a desperate race for talent. And so if that's where the 22 year olds are, that's a really important driver of change. The second important driver of change is inside companies themselves. And whether it relates to the debates within Google about the relationship between Google um, and our national security infrastructure in the United States or the tremendous pushback we've seen on how companies have handled sexual harassment, the movement about the selling of particular technologies to the police, facial recognition technologies, we see a set of incredibly powerful people who have not seen themselves as having agency coming to realize that as the drivers inside these companies that are designing technologies, that are thinking about the user interface, that are working the policy and regulatory issues, that they should have a say as well. And that's incredibly powerful. Um, and then of course, the third piece is that over the last three or four years, we've moved from the caricature of the relationship of democracy to these issues, which was embodied in Senator Orrin Hatch's interaction with Mark Zuckerberg, where Hatch seemed to not understand that, that Facebook had a business model that was built on advertising, to a moment that we're in now coming out of the investigations of the House Judiciary Committee and the appointment of, of new folks in antitrust, both at the FTC and, and DOJ, where a really nuanced understanding of what's going on with big tech uh, is really on display on the part of our policymakers. And though polarization and, and sort of party disagreement are important challenges to tackle, I don't look at this with an electoral cycle approach. I think we're actually entering a policy window. And we've seen that policy window sort of every 30 years when it comes to new technologies. We saw it with the telegraph. We saw it with telecommunications. We're going to see the momentum of our democratic institutions to address these issues. It may start with lower hanging fruit like data privacy and data portability or auditing of algorithms, uh, but it's also going to get to the hard stuff around content moderation and antitrust. So I see it happening before us. If I could hop in here uh, just to add something to this, um, less in the spirit of what Jeremy just described as the ingredients um, or the different components that, that give us a sense of optimism about democratic institutions rising to the challenge, but to, but to put in a really sort of stark way the stakes that I think um, are important um, to communicate. Uh, so, you know, I think that one way to describe the past 30 or 40 years is that we're um, perhaps exiting a moment um, that you could say started with the Reagan revolution in which the smaller that government was, the better that government happened to be. And a reliance on market solutions for most of the problems that beset society and the globe. And you know, when you think about the Silicon Valley orientation to this, um, I sometimes think it's a fair characterization to reduce this to a simple formula. Um, there is a libertarian streak to the founders of big tech companies that's well documented in the social science literature and surveys of founders. And when you map the libertarian approach of the founder onto the optimization mindset of their employees, what you get is an optimization of the minimization of government. And at the extreme, the optimization mindset is always suspicious of democracy itself, because in, in our view, democracy is not an institutional design for optimizing any particular thing. It's a distinctively fair process for refereeing persistent and ongoing disagreement so that we can get temporary solutions to problems that always can be updated in, in future times. 
So that means that the opt optimiz optimizers in Silicon Valley, the libertarians in Silicon Valley, often have a deep suspicion of democracy itself. And now that they've grabbed so much power and we're at a moment of exiting an era in which we've just relied upon the technologists to operate their enormous power with some beneficence over us, our democratic institutions can come back to the fore and you know, I'll be even sort of uncharacteristically even more optimistic than Jeremy here, which is that it's not just that democratic institutions can sort of rise to the challenge, it's that in tackling this distinctive challenge, it will be a way of rejuvenating the faith that ordinary citizens have in democratic institutions to tackle even broader problems than technology itself. Um, that's perhaps um, more hope than um, you know, social science, so to speak. But um, I do think it's a defining challenge of our age to remind ourselves that what we do collaboratively, collectively, when we as equal citizens co-author our own existence rather than relying on experts to solve problems for us, we steer ourselves into a better future. And we're, I hope we are about to enter an era in which all of us feel that collective power more than we have for the past half century. So I love a good optimistic view, especially of these issues. So thank you for Thank you for pre presenting such an op optimistic view. And it is unusual for me to sort of push back on somebody who's seeing the glass as half full. Um, but I, so we're also, we live in a democracy where most of us do not consider ourselves experts in this technology. I mean, even, um, even the dinner table conversations, you know, that I've had with family members over the last couple of months have included sort of lamenting about how much power the tech companies have from the point of view of like, this is the thing we don't understand. Yes, we're citizens in this democracy, but we don't know what to do about it. So, and, and we are more than a little nervous about the state of our democratic institutions, given the givens, right? So um, what's your advice to the regular person who isn't necessarily well-versed in how all of this works but who knows we have a problem and, and may sort of comprehend that it's kind of us to, up to us in the democracy to solve the problem? Like, do we, are we left with just assuming that our policymakers are gonna figure it out and hope that they do? Or is there something that regular folks can do? And so maybe Jeremy, does, maybe this is a question for you. I'm gonna pass this to Maron to start because I know he loves to answer this question, but I'll add, add on top. I think education is really the starting point, right, is to understand, first of all, a little bit about the technologies, and there's a lot of information out there, I mean, part of our role as educators is trying to do that, is to have students both not from only from the technical side, but from the non-technical side, try to understand that. Uh, along those lines, we've also been teaching a evening class for working professionals out in Silicon Valley, where we're located. And the idea is that the more education we can bring to this, the more understanding that people can have. They don't need to know the deep issues involved in the technology, but they do need to get clear about what the technology can do and more importantly, what it can't do. Because sometimes we hear these promises from tech companies around self-regulation and we'll figure it out ourselves with technology. And sometimes the technology just isn't actually at the point where it's gonna solve these problems and we need something more. But education is the first step. The second one is then to get clear on the values that we wanna have. Once we actually understand a little bit about, for example, what machine learning can do and what it can't do, what sort of biases there are in these systems, or how effective they actually are at content moderation, doesn't require that deep understanding, but it does require us to think about how do we think about the notion of content moderation of free speech? Where do we stand on the issue of something like algorithmic decision making that's making significant decisions about our lives without having, say, transparency or due process as to how these algorithms work? Once we get that clarity for ourselves as to what we want, then it becomes much easier for us to engage in the political process. And I'm also optimistic because I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit before we even go after big issues, things like antitrust. There's a lot of things that both the left and the right can agree on. Things mm -hmm. like comprehensive policy around data protection and data regulation. As a matter of fact, if you just look at that specific area, what you see over the last few years is the you know, the state of California, the government of China and the EU all coming about with very similar privacy regulations, but coming at it from entirely different standpoints and from entirely different reasons. But it just shows you how important a piece of legislation like that is. 
And so that's the place that gets me optimistic to think that there are places in tech regulation right now where we can make those kinds of inroads and lay a foundation for incrementally being able to solve bigger and bigger problems. And the one, the one thing I want to add, add to Maron's answer um, is to say that, you know, in our current conversations about big tech, it's very easy to point fingers at the CEOs of these companies and to say the problem rests there. Um, the outcomes that we see in the country are a function of that person's choices. And you can see that with each successive round of stories, like the Wall Street Journal stories last week on the Facebook files, we have this overriding focus on what's happening in the companies and the particular personalities of the leaders of these companies. And I think there are two critical messages of the book. Number one is it's not enough to focus on the personalities. Yes, extraordinary power is in the hands of a small number of individuals, but we have a set of systemic drivers that are creating successive iterations of this kind of concentrated power. But the second thing is that there's, there's blame to be shared and the blame is to be shared with our elected politicians, this technology that Rob described that we use to referee our disagreements and to help us arrive at judgments about how we amplify the benefits or mitigate the harms of particular developments in society. And so that critical last step of Maron's sequence that he described, which is looking at those people that we put in office and holding them accountable for the failure to mitigate the harms of technology. So not just blaming Mark Zuckerberg, but saying to the president of the United States and our elected senators and Congress people, where are you on these issues? We can do that once we have clarity about the values that we wanna see reflected in society writ large, how we wanna value, balance privacy and personal safety, how we wanna balance the returns that we can get from algorithmic decision-making against our concerns about justice and fairness. Everyone can have a view on those issues. The book is trying to empower people to, to articulate those views and engage with neighbors and friends to, to develop an ability to talk about them. But then we need to turn and orient that pressure, not just on the companies, but also on our political system to say we're dissatisfied with the outcomes that we're getting. And part of that failure is the failure of our politicians. I love that. I, as you were talking, Jeremy, I was thinking, you know, you could write an equal book called System Error, where our politics have gone wrong and how to reboot, right? Many of us, you know, New America works intensively on major structural political reform, ranked choice voting, open primaries, multi-member districts. I mean, how to be actively not just represented, but represented in a way that allows us to get the results. So I was listening to you completely agreeing, uh, but it, it, we have to educate the voters. They have to hold people accountable and believe they're empowered, but they also have to, we, they need to be empowered to change the system. I want to shift ground a little bit, and Rob, I will start with you um, on on the a, a sort of diversity question in tech, mm -hmm. because as I read this, and, and part of educating the public is to realize that, you know, as Larry Lessig wrote 20 years ago, right, these decisions are creating the architecture of our society, right? It's code that determines how we interact, but it's invisible architecture. That's right. And it's being designed largely by white men, uh, also, you know, other, other men, mostly men, very few African Americans, very few Hispanic Americans. Uh, really, it's it. If you put the population of Silicon Valley up against the census, you would not be happy with what you see. How do we tackle that? And I guess I'll start by asking: Are you seeing a change in terms of the people who take your courses? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what what should we do about it? Sure. Well, let me start with that 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 question about: Are we seeing a change on campus and in the course? Um, it is true, and this is a positive development, that when, when Meron described at the beginning how large and popular computer science has become as a major, it's also the most popular major for women. And there is indeed much greater gender balance in engineering or the computer science major at Stanford than there historically has been. Um, that augurs well for a more inclusive future within the tech world. And, and again, in the spirit of public interest technology, not just for people who take their tech talent and flow into Silicon Valley companies, but also go to work for nonprofit organizations or public agencies and, and deploy their tech talent in new ways. Um, the 
diversity and inclusion question seems to me essential, and at least for two reasons. There's a common understanding, I think, that there's just a simple unfairness that all of this extraordinary generation of wealth has tended to fall into the hands of the, the founders and the and the you know the, the programmers who tend to be male and hardly representative, not merely as stacked up against the census, but certainly since their products can affect the entire world compared to the whole, wor whole, whole world. And it's true that if you thought about just wealth generation and an equitable distribution of the, you know, the, 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 um, the product of um, the, the, the financial product of these services that are, of course, gained from an extractive industry of taking data from um, people across the world and then selling for many companies that off to advertisers, most people are not being fairly treated. But I want to emphasize a second dimension that I think is also behind your, your question, Anne-Marie, which is that if we have a more diverse class of founders and technologists more generally, people who bring their lived experience, um, whether it's because they belong to a um, a racial or an ethnic group different than the dominant group in technology today, or they happen to come from a different country and bring a set of different lived experiences, we should expect to find a different kind of technology product or, or the solutions that will be on offer may well be different than the kinds of solutions that we see in technology today. And what I think about here, I want to be in certain respect as maximally charitable as I can to the 19 year old computer science major at Stanford, because what that person typically thinks is it's an extraordinary development in the world that a 19 year old can come to campus, get these technical skills, and then you know contribute via programming or coding to some type of product that when I you know change the code base over the weekend, it rolls out on Monday to hundreds of millions of people in principle. What else could you possibly major in or do as, an, as, a, as a kind of profession in which a 22 year old could contribute to the power to affect the world in as obvious a way as tech can? But what's missing in that is the very idea that a small number of people have that much power without bringing to the table the voices of those who are affected by the very technologies they're developing. So if you can roll your product out to millions of people in the world, you had better understand what the perspectives are of the people who are gonna use those products and be affected by them. Why? Because they encode the values that we went back to at the beginning. And the simple kind of delusion of you know, hearing Steve Jobs tell you, don't you want to put a dent in the universe? And then thinking you can do it by coding overnight in your pajamas and rolling your code or product out, you know, on Monday, you've got to be way more discerning about that, which is again, why the ethical frameworks and the social scientific orientation to thinking about technology is so essential. A more diverse and inclusive tech sector will produce different products that are mindful of the benefits and harms that tech produces. Now you're singing Tara's song. <laughs> and Tara, before we jump back to you, I just want to point out that we are going to be taking questions from everybody who's participating. So look for the Slido box to the right of your video. Um, and please send us your questions. We'll be getting to them soon. But Tara, thank you for letting me interrupt. And now back to you. Yeah, I think maybe just picking up there, are there, have you seen any, you know, really taking this to what it looks like when it's, when it's working? Um, are there any promising conversations or, or you know, early parts, uh, examples you'd lift up from the book or elsewhere from your research of bringing broader voices in and how that makes a difference? There is, and you know, one of the things we've seen in our introductory class, for example, which is now taken by a pretty large percentage of all undergrads, is that it's reached basically gender parity. It's on a regular basis close to 50-50 between men and women. Um, so we're at least seeing at the entry point, the place that we can understand the beginnings of the technology and what's possible to do with programming, more of a gender balance coming in. But then what we're also seeing is that those students are taking those skills to a number of different fields. So they're going to think about how can I use programming and the affordances it gives me, say, to do data analysis or something like that in other areas like in medicine or in politics. 
And so there's a two-way street where we can begin to have some of the ideas from technology infuse into other disciplines as a tool to be used to empower those other disciplines. And at the same time, it's bringing ideas from those other disciplines to computing to think about how do we get some of those problems in front of more technologists to actually have an impact. And so what we're seeing as, as time goes on is these questions Rob alluded to of who's building the technology and who are they building it for. I was talking to one venture capitalist a couple of years back who said, you know, we have a whole bunch of companies that are basically their business model is providing lunch to other startup companies. Right. And it just shows you how insular that environment is. And when we begin to open it up for people to think about broader issues, um, we had one student in our class a, a couple of years ago who was looking at the impact of privacy settings and different products on domestic abuse victims. And one of the things she had in mind was, why do I have to go to all these different platforms and set all these different Baroque privacy settings? if I wanna to try to protect my own privacy from someone who is stalking me or someone who's trying to track my information, I'd like to do that in one place in a clear way and just have it propagated to every platform I use. And that idea is so powerful that she started with an impetus that was a particular group of people based on the experiences that she'd had talking to others in that field. And other people, when they saw it said, this is such a compelling idea, it's actually important for everyone. Right, and that's the place where we see the power of these diverse viewpoints is finding solutions, not only for small communities, but the interests of those small communities oftentimes generalize to everyone. So there's real power there and we're beginning to see it. I just have to intervene to say, I thought of that this morning when the news was that the EU is thinking about legislation to demand one universal charger cable for all your devices. And I thought, yes, somebody is, is identifying with you know the frustration of when you've forgotten your charger and you have to get a whatever, but not, not as profound an example, but one that would affect all of our lives. I just wanna add one thing uh, to Maron's comment, which is, you know, and, and maybe it goes without saying, but, you know, the pipeline is only one, one piece of the problem. And, and there's a lot, you know, to feel good about with respect to how the pipeline into tech, you know, is increasingly attractive to a diverse community, male, female, people of color and the like. But the institutions that are the receptacles of, of new technologists have got to be transformed as well. Um, and, and I think about that both with respect to the private sector, which is at the center of our conversation, but also the public sector. So I want to say something about each of them. So, so with the private sector, you know, we are still in the early stages of, of momentum to really overturn kind of dominant norms and practices in large companies that have made these you know, incredibly inhospitable environments for women and for people of color. We have strong and powerful voices, you know, in many of these companies, but lots of those voices are leaving the companies, right? And on the way out, they're raising concerns about cultures that are perceived as, as toxic and unwelcoming. Raising voices has been a really important driver of change. The transformation that happened in Uber as a result of the concerns that were raised uh, by Susan Fowler were, were transformative in terms of its internal culture. Um, and so we're going to need to see more of that because ultimately, if you want to see the translation of, of this new diverse community of technologists who are being trained and have them find a place for themselves in the private sector, the private sector is going to have to welcome them in their whole selves with the concerns that they bring to the table, the issues that they're raising. And we shouldn't pretend that that's naturally going to happen. That's going to be a contested space. And we're still seeing the beginnings of that. The same goes for the public sector, and, and we're talking here with, with folks who've been really interested in how we position our public institutions to be more welcoming of, of technical perspectives and technical knowledge. The public institutions have a lot to offer our young technologists because these are some of the arenas where the kinds of concerns that motivate people, that is, how do we optimize to make sure that, that well-being is something that's broadly achievable by people regardless of their background or regardless of their identity? How do we make sure that broadband is accessible in the last mile? How do we ensure that, that sort of the, uh, the achievement gaps or, or sort of outcome gaps that we see in health and education are actually reduced? These are places where public institutions have a critical role to play. And I think part of what we're trying to do in our, in our efforts in class and with professional technologists and also through the book 
is to reject the idea that the only way to engage on those issues is through the private sector. This notion of I can get fabulously wealthy and make you know, social change in the world, that is the path of the 21st century. And I think we're seeing the limits of that motto. But for the public interest to become a meaningful direction that people pursue, they need to see pathways into the public sector where they can actually bring not only their interests to the table, but also their capabilities and see those capabilities put to use. And that's why this movement around public interest technology is so important. So I can't resist diving into that a little bit more. We're gonna go into the um, questions from all of you. And I'll just remind you again, to use the Slido box to the right of your video to submit questions. And as soon as I ask this one, Anne-Marie, I'll ask you to, to ask the first of the questions that are coming in. But I, I can't resist, since I work on public interest technology at New America, digging into that a little bit more. It seems to me that um, in this conversation in general, that, all roads still lead through the tech companies. So to the extent that we're trying to diversify the skill sets that go into government or into NGOs to try to help us solve our public problems, um, we're still really in a conversation about how do, we, um, how do we bring talent that right now is going to the tech companies and to other sectors. Um, and one of the, the uh, and we're also in a, in a deep conversation about diversifying the kind of talent that goes into tech companies, which I also think is a necessity. And I'll just say to put in a, a plug for our colleague, Andrean Soli's work, New America with many other partners is, has built a public interest technology university network. Stanford is a part of it, but so are some historically black colleges and universities, my other minority serving uh, institutions. Um, and part of the goal is to um, diversify who goes into the tech sector and, and what is it that they know, like get a few more people who think about philosophy and ethics, for example, or about civil rights into the tech companies, but also create an environment in which the way I like to put it is somebody who's in middle school right now decides that they wanna solve homelessness. So they decide that computer science or engineering or design is, is their route to social change. Like we haven't really reached that transformative moment yet. You were all in a university setting, you, you built a course to try to sort of diversify what the many, many computer scientists at Stanford are getting by way of training, but how do we um, kind of change the equation so that the people who are deciding to become computer scientists are people who want to who wanna change the world somewhere other than at a tech company? Can I, maybe I'll, I'll take a crack and start start on that, that that fantastic question because it is indeed something that we've been thinking about ever since we first came together to conceptualize the course. And you know, sometimes the way I think about it in a, in a kind of broader time horizon is that in a really reductive way, I think the 20th century, you know, the most important discipline to study was economics and the most consequential profession, especially in the late 20th century, was that of the financier, transforming and globalizing the world um, in, in all kinds of powerful ways. And in the 21st century, that's changed. The most important discipline is computer science and the most important profession is programmer. And when it is that our, our universities you know, we see the transform the transformation on campuses that people majoring in record numbers in, in computer science. And if they only flow into one destination, um, you know, the usual line of you know, universities uh, training the next generation of leaders, um, putting you know, most of your tech talent into Silicon Valley will never be enough. And just as you said, Cecilia, I think it's essential because of the great power that tech now holds, um, that it's not only a technical skill with that optimization mindset at work, but it's, it's balanced by people who also have a sense of the ethical uh, frameworks, the, the value trade-offs that technologists inevitably have to confront and the social scientific and policy dimensions of all of these great questions. So the tech sector needs to be diversified in that way. And I'll just add, not by appointing a chief ethics officer who, to whom all ethical questions can be outsourced, Ethics has to come, come to be seen as the responsibility of everyone, you know, pushing ethics all the way down the stack, as it were, or all the way into the very earliest moments of product development, not at the tail end when you either decide to release the product or not. And then as, as you know, the spirit of public interest technology also champions, um, 
these extraordinary technical skills, just as has been true in the 20th century with economists, these technical skills can flow into the full array of professional destinations where the programming talent and the data science talents can be put to extraordinary good use. And when we create a kind of set of professional pathways for social scientists and humanists into tech companies and for technical people into civil society and public agencies, I think we'll have a much better world. If I could just add briefly to that, I think, you know, as an educator, I have a little bit of a bias, but I think, you know, education is really the key. And what we've actually seen in about the last five, six years or so is at many state levels, taking a real comprehensive look at computer science education in the K through 12 system as a way to get everyone more informed, not just about what computers can do technically, but also thinking about the broad array of social issues that are involved in building computing technology, and then the ways the computing technology can be used in turn to address different kinds of social issues. And what we're seeing there is a real uptake in this notion that computing is something for everyone in the same way that you could think about, you know, when we study science, we don't have everyone learn about physics because we need more physicists in the world. We have more people study physics because they need to understand what's going on in their world and how does that analytical thinking apply in different areas. That's the same sort of thinking we should be taking for K through 12 computer science education. It's not that we want to churn out an army of programmers. What we want to do is raise the level of digital literacy for everyone so that there's better understanding of how technology is affecting their world and how they can use that technology to make the changes they want to see. So I've got the, I'm going to ask the first question from the audience. Uh, and I, I would, I would agree with that. I would, would add two points. One is everyone who wanted to do anything in the social sciences when I was an undergrad had to take econ 101 and 102, right? You had to know macro and micro, like without that, you weren't really going to be able to operate in the world of social science. And I hope that particularly as coding becomes easier, as it will, I mean, that's part of what we need, to, need to, to do, that there's at least enough basic familiarity to then do one of the other things that will help, which you all are modeling, which is to work in teams, right? You know, I, I'm never going to be able to code, but if I'm literate enough, I'm going to be able to work with people and, and bring my expertise to, to bear. So our first question is from Roger, and it's a question I hear all the time. It's a great question. It's, would regulation uh, or more societal input into big tech that's um, put the big tech of democracies at a competitive advantage or disadvantage to the big tech of autocracies? And Jeremy, I'm gonna direct this to you and you've heard this argument so many times. And when the antitrust argument comes up, the first response you get is all we're doing is tying our hands vis-a-vis -vis China. So this is a genuine, uh, general version of that question. I mean, I think we're at a moment where this, this sort of viewpoint is very much in the public conversation and something that we need to engage critically because as we think about the societal harms, whether it's on the social media platforms, issues related to the concentration of power in a small number of companies, um, a lot of what you hear is, well, what about China? If we can strain our companies in various ways, if we address these societal harms, we will lose the race with China. Um, and I think you see this in commission reports and efforts to drive, uh, you know, greater funding to AI and the like. I guess what I just say is this is a false choice to make. I just totally reject and we reject this false choice. Um, you know, if, if you think about what's unfolding with the impact of tech on society, that has huge consequences for our ability to compete with China over the long run whether our democracy survives, whether we can maintain a shared consensus in the United States about what we care about and how we think about one another and how we relate to one another, whether we have a healthy information ecosystem in which we can elect politicians and hold them accountable, whether we have an economic system that benefits not only a very small number of individuals um, uh, you know, who sit in Silicon Valley, but a larger whole, especially in parts of the country that have been left behind. Those are absolutely existential issues. And if you think that we can effectively compete with China without addressing those issues, then I think you're missing the point. And so our view is that let's not paint this as a false choice. Let's make smart decisions about the appropriate rules of the road for technology, but let's not pretend 
that we can pursue the kind of international competition that we need on the economic front or on the political front without addressing the core issues that ail us at home. And at the center of that is the regulation and ultimately establishment of a framework for technology's societal effects. Um, and we're dealing with the near-term ones today, privacy, algorithmic auditing, et cetera. Of course, the big one is, is what is automation gonna mean for the future of the workforce? And when you look at the data and you think about who automation is really going to affect, it is at first going to affect a population of folks who are at the lower end of the income distribution, who are gonna see their jobs changed and affected. But one of the real changes is that our, our advances in AI are so powerful that computer programmers are gonna be affected by AI. Doctors are gonna be affected by AI in ways that we need our politics to get its head around. And the idea that we have to throw our hands up and say, let's ignore these societal harms in order to pursue competition with China is just the latest tool of a set of tech elites and financiers behind big tech who'd like to say, just leave it to us. We're the beneficent sort of folks in charge of this direction and we've got it all uh, you know, under control. And I think the moment that we're in is no longer do people feel comfortable leaving it in the hands of, of sort of the tech elite to make those decisions for us. So let's not accept this false trade-off. We tend in our politics to often be presented with false trade-offs. We saw this in the aftermath of 9-11 right? Do you want your civil liberties or do you want to be safe from terrorism? Uh, and we've learned some important lessons from how, how baldly that trade-off was presented to Americans over time. Let's not fall into that trap again. Here, here. <laughs> I'm going to take us, I think, in a shift in direction. Um, this is a question from the audience. We've talked in this conversation about the role of the academy, the role of kind of the individual but the questioner asks, what role can civil society organizations play in working for change, religious, consumer, um, other types of institutions? Let me, let me begin with that. Um, it's a fantastic question because the civil society organizations are so often the ones left behind or left out of um, a set of considerations uh, for how it is that you know, democratic institutions and the marketplace operate. Um, I think civil society institutions are in fact one of the most promising places where citizens can exercise their voices. Because as Jeremy you know, explained earlier, um, we shouldn't expect our elected officials in one fell swoop and one regulatory moment to solve a whole set of problems. Um, and plus we have uh, all the familiar forms of dysfunction, polarization, you know, a, perhaps a shared interest in, 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 in tech policy or regulation, but for very, very different reasons between the two parties. Well, one of the most obvious and historically relevant places that citizens can exercise a voice is by assembling together in common groups, but with perhaps different goals um, that are communicating their shared interests to a wider public. And we work out within civil society um, the, the kind of contested feelings and ideas and preferences that people have about a whole range of policy topics or areas where it has both an educational effect for or other ordinary citizens, where of course journalism plays a hugely important role, and it has a, an important effect of sort of going upward into the formal institutions of government, communicating what the shared interests are and disparate and di different interests are of different groups in society, so that th these bubble up from otherwise small individual things. Um, one last pitch on this, just to say why I think this is so important, is that the tech companies would far prefer um, a, a kind of discourse in which they said, um, you should think of yourself as a consumer or a user of the technology, and if you don't like it, then just don't use it. And don't like Facebook, then delete the app. Don't like you know, um, your search engine, we'll choose another one. That kind of reductive thinking about which it's always got to be a small little note card of a small number of options presented to someone in the perspective of a user, it misleads us from the collective power we can exercise, not just by voting, which is one important tool, of course, but by participating in shared civil society groups, the kinds of things that are hyper-local um, in, in your own community 
It doesn't have to be a check writing thing to the ACLU because you like what they do on privacy. It can be a small little community group in your own neighborhood that's concerned about next door's privacy policies and the stuff that you see on its own newsfeed about your own neighborhood. Um, so I think there's extraordinary hope to be found in civil society groups. And that's one of the most important pathways for an ordinary person who thinks the technology just acts upon them where they can now exercise their own agency. So keep the questions coming. There are some really excellent ones. Um, it's getting hard to choose. But, <laughs> so I'm gonna choose one from Lily who asks, how do we reverse the indoctrination that students receive while in STEM majors, which contributes to their lack of agency when they enter the workplace? Well, one thing I'd say, it's not just STEM majors. I think students in general sometimes feel a lack of agency as to what they can do. And it's they feel that there are certain choices provided to them, and those are the only choices that they can choose from. And part of understanding that there is a broader array of what students can choose to now go form or get involved with. I'll give you kind of one example is the US Digital Service, where that's a place where technologists have found that there's a real need in government to be able to bring tools from what they've learned in their classes, but also from people who've been working in Silicon Valley for years to go and have a real impact in bringing those digital tools to government. I think the indoctrination point is a little bit, you know, I would, I would reframe that a little bit to think about what is the agency that students feel that they have in terms of the choices they can make. What we're seeing on campus, for example, is students choosing which companies they want to go to, or even after they've chosen to go to a particular place to actually engage in protests while they're there, if they believe that there's uh, policies those companies are engaging in that they don't like. So I think that's the awakening that's happened that we've talked about a little bit before is that it's no longer just seen as there is an industry in which someone goes and plugs into for a job and they have to do whatever the rules of that industry are, but really individuals find two courses. One is they can go to that industry and play a much larger role in their, as their agency as technologists or, or whatever other role they play. But secondly, they can actually choose a different path, which is forming a nonprofit or an NGO to be able to actually address some of these issues. And we're seeing more of that. For example, uh, Timnit Gebru, who was just at Google and controversially was fired, is actually starting her own organization to do research around the harms of technology. And that's a whole different way that she can bring her expertise to be applied to the sector. I just want to add something because obviously as, as a social scientist, I'm new to the engineering space and, and part of teaching with Robin Maron and engaging students in STEM fields has been an introduction for me to different mindsets and different approaches. And one of the things that most strikes me in, in that environment is how much our students struggle with questions that don't have a right or wrong answer. That there's something in the, in the, in the DNA of, of computer science and engineering, maths and stats that underlie it, where students really get um, acculturated to the notion of, of questions having a right answer and, and the path being more or less efficient to the right answer and people getting credit for that. And so part of what we do in, in teaching students is give them all sorts of questions that don't have a right or wrong answer. And you can imagine how frustrating that is from a grading perspective, because uh, people are like, well, did I get 100% or not? And if the answer is I didn't get 100%, why not? Was it not the right answer? And I just want to give you one example of this. It, you know, when we're working with our undergraduates, we often frame dilemmas for them and have them exercise their collaborative and democratic muscles to think about these technological dilemmas. One that we gave our students uh, last year was to basically think about uh, the advent of these new technologies that would enable universities to optimize advising and mental health service provision for students on the basis of data that's gathered about students on a regular basis. Like what time did you re-enter your dorm every night this week, which is embedded in the key card system? Or how often have you been to the library this quarter? Or what is happening when you go to the dining hall? How long do you stay there, right? And how much are you checking out? Like how, you know, the volume that you're, you're eating and the like. These are things that are all available to the university and you have all sorts of technology companies who are like, look at this extraordinary data. We can optimize 
the provision of advising services to individuals and we can catch people right before there's a mental health crisis. Uh, well, obviously this raises all sorts of concerns for students uh, about the extent to which they exist in a surveillance society on campus and we're not even aware of it. Um, and so in putting to students the question not only of what's technically possible with this data, that is, could you develop a predictive algorithm that actually did a reasonably good job of helping advisors engage with students uh, before a crisis reaches a boiling point? It also raises all of the uncomfortable questions that don't have a right answer about should we do this? And what are we trading off in doing this? And who benefits and who is harmed? And I think developing that muscle memory in, in STEM students, right? Breaking them away from the notion that there are right answers and wrong answers, black and white, but actually there are just better and worse answers to hard questions. And part of the way that we determine whether those are better or worse answers is by exercising the, 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 the sort of act of explanation and defense of these different viewpoints to one another and to people with different views. That's what hasn't been happening enough. And we need to create the dynamic for that to unfold on campuses and then inside companies. Uh, maybe picking up on that, and I will say as someone else teaching the resonance of, is it right or is it wrong? <laughs> um, you know, I think this is, the, this is our normative training. I'm gonna offer up a question from an undergraduate for Rob, um, who says, as an undergraduate that studies tech from a philosophical perspective, I often get asked why a normative lens? What is your go-to argument in favor of philosophy? All right. Well, that's a question, right? You know, it goes right to the heart of, of how I think about um, I'm showing up in a classroom at all, or even why I chose philosophy as something to do um, with, with my life. And, and I, I'm going to be totally sincere, and but maybe a little, you know, predictable, which is that the kinds of moral choices that confront us as human beings are inevitable. Um, we have to make conflict-ridden choices with a welter of extraordinarily important values in the world. Um, tragedy in the philosopher's view, my view, is not there's a really good thing that can happen to you and there's a really bad thing that happens and it's tragic if the bad thing happens. Tragedy is that there are multiple good things that we all want in a life and we can't get all of them all at once and so we're doomed to make choices amongst the things that are actually valuable. And so what makes philosophy important to a technologist is not that there's like um, a calling for technologists alone to think about the choices they have to confront as a technologist or as a human. It's a common human predicament to confront these choices. So what I would say to anyone is, do you prefer to be morally sleepwalking through life? Somehow thinking that you had a moral compass all set and you no longer need to reflect? Of course not. The Socratic life about the unexamined life is not worth living is, is the motto here. Moral sleepwalking is a disastrous approach to living. So wake up and confront the moral choices that beset all of us and get in the conversation. Thank you, Rob. I'm going to kick it over to um, Anne Marie, but I do think, you know, at some point we could have a whole conversation about the declining majors and the importance of perhaps escalating what isn't what used to be in the 350%. But Anne Marie, over to you. I'm just smiling at the idea of a class called Moral Sleepwalking. I think that <laughs> maybe a seminar, but I think it's a great title. Um, so I have a question that that a couple of you may want to answer, but I'll start with Jeremy. Um, and it says, I'm wondering if there's a way to collaborate with other local universities who have major CS programs like SJSU, and I'm gonna assume that's San Jose State University, uh, because it says that arg arguably puts more technologists out into Sil Silicon Valley. And I, I know, Jeremy, you run the Impact Labs, and I thought you might want to, uh, to talk about how in, in many ways, a version of the model the three of you have are, are putting together at the, the curricular level uh, might, might take place more at the collaborative level. I mean, whoever sent in that question and whoever's interested in collaboration, you know, look up our email addresses and send us a note. I think when, when people have asked us what comes after the book, and it's something that we've been thinking about a lot, I think our answers by and large for the three of us focus on changing the culture of tech 
cultivating an ethic of responsibility in tech, not because we don't think the regulatory questions are important, they're absolutely important, uh, but there are a lot of actors focused on shaping that regulatory space. Um, and we think that, that sitting at Stanford and, and sitting at a set of institutions that train future technologists, there's incredible work to be done in creating space for the kinds of conversations that we're talking about today to happen on campus. We know that students want to have those conversations, but sometimes students need to have a license to have those conversations. And we also know from the work that we've done together how challenging it is to have those conversations. That you know the old model of, of the sort of ethics class in engineering or in computer science where you primarily focus on the role of an individual engineer not to do harm. And you think about the construction of nuclear weapons or the failure to get plans right when a bridge was built just isn't up to the current moment that we have where technologies are generating harmful effects that are in part about the product, but in part go well beyond the product. And where thinking about resolving those issues isn't just a question of getting the design right, but it's getting a design that makes sense for a democratic society that disagrees about what might be the right path forward. And so we just see ourselves as part of an emerging conversation. Some is the public interest technology network and Marie that, that you described that New America has been involved in, uh, Mozilla, Amidiar, and others have been invested in notions of responsible CS, bringing together faculty across institutions. Um, we just think there's an extraordinary opportunity for those of us who have the privilege of being able to teach future technologists to, to generate and energize a set of conversations that could have sweeping implications for the future of technology. Maybe not the power of the company over the next five years, let's that, let that be a regulatory enterprise that's basically unfolding. But I think we have to break out of university models that treat people in silos that, that are built around our construction of disciplines you know, part of what's unusual here is that Rob and, and I, a political scientist and a political philosopher, are teaching in the computer science department. You know, how does the political science department feel about that? Well, they're wondering why I'm not teaching more political scientists. And I say, well, all those political scientists have become computer scientists. So I'm going to teach them in the computer science department to think about politics, to think about institutions, and to think about democracy. Um, but to colleagues who want to think together about this, get in touch. We're thinking about sort of standing up a set of initiatives that are really cross-institutional, uh, focused on really cultivating this new ethic of responsibility, and we're looking for partners everywhere. Great. So um, the next question I'm going to direct um, to you, Mehran, it comes from, from Mirte, who is a fan of Code in Place, um, asking for suggestions on resources for non-tech people to better educate and inform ourselves about tech companies and practices. Well, thanks for the reference to Code in Place. Um, and if you took part either as a student or a section leader, we really appreciate it. Code in Place was just a little program to get volunteers from around the world to teach people around the world about computing. Um, and it just warmed the cockles of my heart how many people just came together to actually do that purely as a volunteer effort. Um, so thank you. Um, but. In terms of resources, there's a number of resources that we've made available to our class, which are available publicly now. Um, if you want to go to the website, it's cs182.stanford.edu, and all the materials are there. There are some materials that we actually had custom written, some case studies that we got journalists in the field to, to help in terms of framing and writing um, that we've made available through uh, Creative Commons license. And we've also developed a set of study questions around them. So the case studies are available on the, on the website. Actually, for the website for the book, we have some additional links there where we're also going to have the links to the, uh, the case study questions. Um, but the space is evolving pretty quickly. And so two things to keep in mind is there are some readings that we have in there that we think of as kind of more foundational or that help get people from different disciplines to understand each other's language and to think about things. But that set of readings that we have, we actually update every year because the, the arena of these changes is, or these the, these. Uh, uh, technological issues is changing so quickly. So we will keep that information up to date, um, but the ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery, is also putting together a repository of materials around ethics for computing, and that would be another place to look at. 
I'm happy to open up um, with, an, with another question, which is uh, from the audience. Is there a definition of public interest technology that differentiates it cleanly from commercial interest technology that sometimes serves the public? So I'd love to um, open that up to any of the panelists. Maybe Anne Marie or Cecilia or Tara, you should feel free to give a crack at an answer. Answer too. You you've been championing this work for a long time. Um, I'm happy to chime in, but uh, it would be great to hear from you as well on this. I'm happy to start. And having worked at a definition uh, with a number of professors, including Jeremy, um, anyone should you know, Hannah Schenk and I in our book take a um, a very clarified definition of public interest technology. I will say, in doing our research. We had really provocative questions put to us, like, didn't the folks inventing the atom bomb think it was in the public interest? <laughs> you know, that this is like a your public interest sits, um, gives a lot of editorial control. I think, um, you know, we lay out uh, that public interest technology isn't, in fact, a technology. It is a practice because by the time um, anyone publishing a book here knows, by, by the time you pick a technology, it is truly obsolete. Um, but to sort of say that uh, the practice of technology um, needs to be serving the public interest, and we anchor into uh, kind of three aspects of that. But I do think this is a um, this is a complex question, and so uh, ha happy to hear from you know Rob, Jeremy, and Marie others on it. So I love this notion of, of a practice and, and Tara, we spent you know, many hours deliberating over these definitions as, as public interest technology university network was being built. I think I have some very clear senses of what it's not. Um, you know, I think there's a way in which public interest technology has, has sometimes been interpreted as like, let's just bring the technical folks in to build you know, great websites for government or build you know, great mechanisms for learning from government data. Um, and, and some of the early enthusiasm and the rose colored glasses about technology and what technology brings to the table, I think we're really in that spirit. Um, but the reason that focusing it on it as a practice, uh, as an exercise in thinking about uh, not only what new technologies bring to the table, but also the, the consequences of those new technologies for society, not just the private interests of the companies that build them, or the interests of the agencies that deploy them if they're in the public sector is to recognize that we have to grapple with that hard question of what's in the public interest. Um, and, and ultimately one anecdote in this respect, it's one of the first questions that I ask students in, our, in, our, uh, in the class that we teach together. I ask them, what is the public interest? And I remember the very first year that we taught this course, a student raised their hand and said, well, I'm a member of the public, so what's in my interest is the public interest. And I think that just underscores the thinness of, of our, our ability in this day and age to grapple with notions of the public um, and to separate what are the kind of collective result of deliberation and debate in society about what we want from what is really the interest of a private company. Right, in you know, you think about the mission statements of of Uber or Facebook or Google that that aspire to what are really public ends. But part of what we've been discovering over the last five to seven years, ultimately, is that um, they are not primarily focused on public ends. They are driven by private ends. Sometimes those have extraordinary positive externalities for societies. Sometimes they have really negative social consequences. And so it is the responsibility of our democracy to grapple what with what the public is. And, and part of the reason I push back on simply the deployment of technology for public spirited goals as being the sum total of public interest technology is that I think there are responsibilities for private companies as well with respect to these social effects. And so I never want our focus on public interest technology to be reducible to that subset of students who raise their hand and say, I wanna work in the federal government, or I wanna work in a nonprofit, I wanna work on criminal justice reform because I want all the students who aren't choosing to raise their hand for that to also feel that there's something called the public interest that they have to care about, they have to be responsible for, and they have to grapple with in the context of the work that they do in the private sector. 
Can I add on here? I'll, I'll, I'll try out something I've only, uh, I've only sort of offered up on, on a few occasions and I'm still working through it. So I wanna say it's, I guess I'm tentatively offering this up, but I, I kind of elevate this, the difference between a, a private interest technologist and a public interest technologist to a kind of slightly different dimension or space, which is I'll go out on a limb and say, as I've come to understand the, you know, the kind of orientation and practice of computer scientists somewhat over the course of the past five years, I often feel like the questions that AI scientists have asked themselves or technologists have asked themselves is how can we get machines to do things as, as well as or perhaps better than humans? Um, can we get a machine to beat the checkers champion? Can we get it to beat the chess grandmaster? Can we get it to do out? Can we get it to do things better than humans can? I feel like that's just a profoundly, you know, mistaken framework to impose upon technical talent in the first place, or to ask of technical talent in the first place. Why do we play chess together with each other? Well, yes, we have a set of rules which identify Anne Marie, if you're the winner or I'm the winner, or there's a draw and there's a competition at one simple level of chess, but we play chess because it coordinates human activity in a way that develops our capacities as humans. So when you develop a machine that can defeat Garry Kasparov and say, well done technologist, way to go deep blue, you've only done the first level of defeating someone, but you have completely ignored and even undermined the second and more important level of coordinating human activity, allowing for the development of human capabilities. So for me, a public interest technologist is someone who stops asking of themselves, can we get a machine to do something better than a human? And asks of themselves, can we get machines or technology that coordinate human behavior and, and help to amplify or augment human capabilities? Oops, Anne-Marie? I was saying I love that. And there's no better argument for having philosophers engage with technologists probably than that, that kind of different thinking. I've never actually thought about it that way. Uh, and it, it's a very rich vein. So we are 10 minutes to time and we're gonna close out uh, really by asking a question that you should ask of all authors when they have a new book and again, uh, the book is a terrific read and, and a teaching tool uh, and a, a provocative you know, general audience book. I can assure you, uh, having read it, that this is a book you can give to anyone and anyone can read. That's the point of it. But I want to ask each of you in turn, and Mehran, I'll start with you, what, what is the one thing that you hope your readers will take away from this book? And obviously, each of you can have a different answer. <laughs> So Mehran, let's start with you. I think the thing I'd like people to take away is a sense of their role in the bigger picture, a sense that everyone plays a role. And you know, part of the book was written for technologists to say, well, you, these are issues you need to think about when you're in your company or you're creating some new venture. But it's much, much broader than that. It's also a set of issues for people to think about from different sectors as to how technology impacts them. It's for policymakers to understand that if we have things like AI coming down the road, we're gonna to need to reskill people. We're gonna to need to have policies in areas that are not about technology, that are about things like education to be able to mitigate some of the impacts that are gonna be resulting from technology. And ultimately to think in people's roles as citizens, to understand that they play a role in how these issues are going to play out, that they're not powerless, and that by understanding what's actually going on, they have a lot more power than they think. That's terrific. Jeremy, you're next. So I think there's been a myth of Silicon Valley that we need to bust. And, and the myth is, is this embrace of disruption without regard to the consequences. The idea that move fast and break things is, is something to celebrate and there's no alternative to that if we want the benefits of technology. And I just think it's dead wrong. Um, and, and it's generated a passivity in our democracy um, and a paralysis because people act as if the effects of technology on all of us are somehow fixed or preordained. And I don't think that's right at all. The, the effects of technology on society are a function of choices that we make. And those choices are choices about the technologies that we design, who they're for, who they're not for, 
their choices about how we see technology interacting with human capability and human judgment, and their choices about the steps that we take in our politics to mitigate harms or not mitigate harms, to pave the path to the information superhighway through a regulatory oasis or to anticipate potential harms, look for them and adjust to them, either through direct engagement in the tech sector or through the kinds of complementary policies that Maron described. Um, so there's nothing preordained about the path that we're on, but I think we've been told that there is and that we face this false choice between benefiting from technology and all that it brings to our lives uh, or bringing a stop to the innovation engine in the United States. And I think we reject that. And, and so part of that is about reasserting agency, but we have to come to believe that that, that, that storyline is just not true. No false binaries. Right. <laughs> so Rob, bring it home. All right, well, I'm gonna go back to the philosophical impulse in me. So you know, for me, the main message of the book is that for anyone who reads it, we all need to wake up. And I mean that in two respects. We need to wake up to the big power grab that big tech has taken over the past 10 or 15 years, where a small number of people and a small number of companies are exercising this enormous amount of power over us, leading, as Jeremy just described, to a certain sense of passivity on the rest of us. And secondly, wake up to the, um, you know, the dangers of moral sleepwalking. Um, technology encodes within it a set of values they're not neutral. They're not scientifically objective in the sense that they escape from all human bias. Um, they are themselves a set of values and choices made by human beings that are now dressed up as machine, um, machine decision making. Um, we all need to wake up to the idea that we have to confront trade offs in life. We have to identify the values that we care about privacy versus personal safety and national security, um, the benefits of automation and the value of human agency in actually doing things ourselves or the effects on human welfare and material well-being and on and on. The book tries to enumerate and clarify what some of the value trade-offs are. And I want everyone to wake up to those and to weigh in now with their own views. So I love that. And there really is a, a common thread in all in your answers. Uh, which which the book directly addresses, which is, you know, these questions are for everyone, everyone, right? We can all participate. We must all participate. And I, I want to just end uh, where, where we started by pointing out that because the three of you collaborated, because you have all Mehran's technical knowledge and philosophical knowledge and political knowledge, you're able to take these complicated questions that have been so that they have been under this veil of mystery, you know, oh, oh, you know, computer science, if you don't know how to code, if you don't know how to do data analysis, you can't really participate. And you've made it clear that no, this is like anything else in a democracy. We regulate all sorts of complicated things, and yet we're not all financiers and we're not all the doctors. And tech is no different. So it, again, it's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it's a book for um, anyone. Uh, and it's also, again, it's a great read. It's written in a very accessible way with lots of great stories. So with that, I want to thank uh, our authors, uh, Jeremy Weinstein and Rob Reich. Uh, thank you so Rob much. Zahami, uh, and also my fellow moderators, Cecilia Munoz and Tara McGinnis. Uh, and as always, uh, Vantisha Flood, who has helped us put this on, uh, and the New America events staff, uh, it's really, uh, without you, we simply couldn't do this. And thanks to you, the audience. <laughs>